this boy said the Bible is historically accurate? Yo! I didn't realize this guy was writing for Christianity. And he's like, no, actually, the Bible is literally correct. Google it. Woo! I'm saying it. All right. Here are my two goats. Okay. Two friends of the show duking it out with one another. Not duking it out, but like actually having a, a fun and cordial conversation, I suspect. Norm Finkelstein talking to Mark Lamont Hill about Gaza. The U.S. could have stopped Israel on day one. Israel's brutal war on Gaza continues, and Israel is facing a case of genocide at the International Court of Justice. But are we at a turning point for Western support of Israel? And what future is there for Gaza and for Palestine more broadly? Earlier, I went to New York to speak to one of the foremost scholars on Israel-Palestine, Norman Finkelstein. Professor Norman Finkelstein, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank, thank you for having me. You've been an advocate for Palestinian freedom mm -hmm. for decades. You devoted much of your life, certainly your scholarship, to this. Uh, you're also the child of Holocaust survivors. Your parents mm -hmm. uh, were in the Warsaw ghettos during the uprising. They were both taken to concentration camps. Your father was even in the Auschwitz death march. How do experiences like this inform your work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I came from a very political home. That was just a fluke of fate. No other people who survived, they weren't steeped in, immersed in, passionate about politics. <clears throat> my parents were. Actually, I'm not sure if this is the best way to begin the interview, but my parents had a very turbulent, tormented marriage. I think both of them never really recovered from what happened to them and what happened to their families on both sides. Every member of the family was exterminated. And so it was not a happy marriage. Um, but I remember my mother once saying to me, that for all, your, for all the horrors of the marriage, we never disagreed on politics, meaning she and my father. And they had very strange politics by current standards. They were both fanatically pro-Soviet, pro-Russian, because they looked at the world through the lens of the Nazi Holocaust. Mm. And the Soviet Union defeated the Nazis, there's no question about that. 90% uh, of the German troops, the army, they were fighting on the Eastern Front. Um, my parents were fanatical Stalinists. Long after the Soviet Union had distanced itself from Stalin, the famous speech by Khrushchev in 1956, um, my parents would not brook any criticism of Stalin mm. till, the, their de till their last days, their last breaths. Um, and I think there were probably the only two Stalinists left in the <laughs> world. It was very funny when I, let's say when I was in seventh grade, who was professor, the teacher, was Josh Abramson. And we were discussing World War II, and I didn't know better, I was defending Stalin and Russia and singing their <laughs> praises. I remember the uh, teacher, Mr. Abramson, he said that you realize how many people Stalin killed? So what do I know in seventh grade? So I went home and I said to my mother, do you realize how many people Stalin killed? And she said, well, Stalin said that this generation is going to suffer, but the next generation will live better. Next day I go up to sc go into school, raise my hand. Stalin said this generation will suffer, but the next generation will live better. So Mr. Abramson says, in other words, you're saying, Mr. Finkelstein, he did call us by our surnames. <laughs> he said, in other words, Mr. Finkelstein, you're saying that the ends justify the means. Well, I didn't have a clue what that meant. But I went home and I said to my mother, in other words, mom, you're saying the ends justify the means. And she <laughs> said, well, in this case, yes. And I went back and I just repeated it. I had the clue what I was talking about, obviously. Um, so you've been riling people up for years. <laughs> well, I wasn't intentionally doing it, but you understand that at that age, you're very influenced by your parents. Yeah. I remember in sixth grade, it was 1964, and it was the presidential election. It was between um, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. And my parents were very, again, 64, before being anti-war was popular. They were very anti the Vietnam War. And I came to class one day, and I raised my hand, and I said, well, in my opinion, Lyndon Baines, President Johnson is belligerent, okay? The teacher said, sit down, you don't even know what the word means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard you say something like that in interviews before. <laughs> I've been watching on the internet lately. But let me ask you something, though, because you are a controversial voice, clearly since middle school. Uh, you're, one Great of, school. I'm <laughs> you're one of the leading you know, scholars in the mm. world on this topic, but you're also one of the most controversial ones. I mean, you've been called, quote, the mm -hmm. foremost Jewish anti-Semite mm -hmm. on planet Earth. Some people mm -hmm. even call you a Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. But why does your work generate these types of responses? Um, I think it's a kind of paradox to tell you the truth, because as you well know, my actual political opinions are very conventional and well within the mainstream. For example, long after the whole of the left went over to this notion of one state, 
I was still advocating two states, yeah. whereas the whole left was it's true. It's true. He actually was. And that's why originally, originally he had a falling out with BDS and BDS supporters. He's talked about this quite a bit where uh, like he lost his like only only leg of support when he took this position. I'm trying to anchor their thinking in things like settler colonialism and this and that. I was very firm in just in repeating what international law said. I, I thought that was the best vocabulary uh, to try to reach a broad audience. So the controversial part comes, I think, from there's a certain element of, I will say, fanaticism to me, which is I read everything and I'm ready to cite chapter and verse and everything. So I don't give my, so to speak, adversaries any wiggle room. There's not a kind of debate. No, I go in for the kill. Yes. You're lying. That's not true. That's false. And I <clears throat> am relentless. I know that I'm relentless because I spend, a, I think it's a kind of ideological war. Um, and I'm, I am relentless. I know that, but that's because I do the work. Have you lost faith in those, mm -hmm. ref, in those reference points and those frameworks? I mean, I know you used past tense when you mm -hmm. said, I held on to the, 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 the mm -hmm. two-state idea. Mm -hmm. I believed in international law. Mm -hmm. Do you now no longer have faith that those are effective uh -huh. frameworks for getting a pr practical outcome? Okay, those are two separate questions. Yeah. Um, on the question of international law, obviously it moves very slowly, you know, pain, painfully slowly when people are being killed in the genocide. And so there's a certain degree of more than impatience. There's a degree of indignation. So, for example, on the car ride over here, I was reading the new International Court of Justice uh, response to South Africa. And it goes on for about 12 pages. And they say, we have to first consider this point. We have to first consider that point. And we have to first consider this, that, and other. All right, come on, guys. Let's just cut to the chase. People are getting killed. People are dying of starvation. But on the other hand, I have to say there's a kind of, I don't know, I was kind of touched by the fact that at the end of the day, the law at a huge price for the people of Gaza, but the law seems to be kicking into place. And for example, right now, as we speak, 31% of children under the age of two are facing acute malnutrition in the northern part of Gaza. They went through the evidence and they concluded, no, Israel has got to give, let the food in, you know. It took 12 pages, it took six months, but the law is, you know, kicking in, so. But will I, the food be let in? I mean, we saw after the January yeah, decision, I know. not much changed. I know, and then what do you do? Mm. You know, on the one hand, it's a very slow, tedious process uh, while the numbers of uh, since the January 26th decision of the court, uh, 5,000 more people have been killed. So, yeah, it's... So then, so then why, do you, why, why do you have any optimism that mm -hmm. any of this matters? Uh, particularly because I think about in 2020 when you actually mm -hmm. stopped writing on Gaza mm -hmm. and you said you felt like the work you, you were doing was yeah. sort of, uh, I think you said pointless and mm -hmm. purposeless. Mm -hmm. um, why is it less pointless and purposeless now when we see legal decisions coming out, international mm -hmm. outrage, and yet Israel still remaining fairly obstinate? I guess the simple answer is twofold. Number one, if you do nothing, you can be certain nothing will happen. So that's not an option. And um, the, the second uh, thing is- Dude, he promises a fun day? Dude, what do you mean? If this ain't fun for you, I don't know what to tell you. Is that you do see changes. I mean, it's not what you would want, obviously, but you do see change. For the ICG, first of all, the fact that South Africa went to bat for Palestine. Extraordinary. You know, not one Arab state, not one Arab state. It took South Africa, you know? The fact that the vote was 14 to two. I said, this is impossible before the vote. I kept counting. I could only come up with six countries that really? we vote for. Wow. If you, I would have bet every single dollar I own that it was impossible that the US and Germany would vote yes. There are grounds to be optimistic. Not the least, for me, the most optimistic thing is the young people. Hmm. If you had told me that people were going to keep coming out to demonstrations week after week after week after week, I, for six months, I would never have believed it. The tenacity, the conviction, you know, it's, it's really an extraordinary sight to behold. You know, somebody Place. said I was at a demonstration three weeks ago. It was at Washington Square Park in Manhattan. It was pouring rain and it was um, a Saturday 
and there were about 50,000 people there. And um, they were all around 25. I was an age cohort of one. <laughs> and then there was a gap, literally, there was a gap of 40 years, wow. you know? And then after it was over, a lot of people went down to the subway to go home. And so in the subway platform, on this side of the, tr of the train tracks and then on the other side of the train tracks, everyone's still chanting, everyone's still chanting. If you know the scenes from the civil rights movement in the United States, yeah. how when they were in jail, they kept singing and they kept chanting and they kept singing and they kept chanting. I really want to know if you would condemn Islam since it openly supports slaughter and pedo. I can give verses from scholars to back this. Oh man, that's awesome. I like that we have to have this conversation every day, dude. Every day. Listen, brother, religion is a weapon that you can wield in the direction of good or in the direction of evil. If you think that the entirety of a religion and all of its supporters are exactly the same as the most brain dead, most fundamentalist charlatans and their advocacy, you're simply doing backwards thinking. Okay. This is small mindedness. That's it. That's all it is. Now, this kind of thinking might actually help or might actually be celebrated in other circles, but this is not one of those circles. You will not find any allies with this kind of sentiment. Absolutely zero people should think that Ben Shapiro represents the average Jewish sentiment. Absolutely zero people should think that the Christian fundamentalists represent the average Christian sentiment, and many don't especially in the Western world. Because in the Western world, Ben Shapiro and others also say that this is a, a nation founded on Judeo-Christian values. This is considered a part of the in-group, so you can actually have more nuanced thinking. Because this is what you grew up with. This is what you learned. So you know that no, not all Christians believe in the most fundamentalist aspects, and not all Jewish people believe in the bastardization of Judaism to begin with, okay? But you somehow feel as though Islam and all of its supporters are monolithic. Nowhere in the Bible advocates for these things. Ah, ah, my friend, the Bible has been utilized to advocate for slavery. What do you mean? I mean, just the simple question alone of how old was Mary when God f***ed her should help you come to different conclusions than the ones you currently have. And no murder? Bible's got a lot of murder. The difference, of course, is that I do not believe that this represents the entirety of the Christian religion, nor does it represent the entirety of Christian believers of the faith. Every religion has been used in support of awful things, whether it be slavery, genocide, pedophiles, or incest. I already had addressed that, but I guess you failed to recognize that. And it was like these young people, except there's one difference. The people in the civil rights movement were fighting for their own rights. Right. These were young people fighting for Gaza. You know, two million people in a, some ghetto way off in the Middle East. It's deeply inspiring. No, oh, absolutely. So there's every reason on those grounds, both to be proud of, you know, the capacity of human sympathy and solidarity, uh, but also <clears throat> on the grounds of being hopeful. As a follower of Christ, I can say Bible, especially Old Testament, has some very unethical elements that we would never find acceptable today. There was also very ethical elements in the Old Testament. My favorite being the one about uh, how 30 children were making fun of a bald man, and then the bald man said, F you, and then bears came and ate those children. Never make fun of the bald. That's actually a good lesson. Yeah. Bald man bear. One of the things you talked about was how arguments that were on the margins have shifted, at least mm -hmm. to the mainstream, to be debated. They're now debatable. Correct. They're engageable. And they no longer can be shot down with you're an anti-Semite. Right. Those days are over. You made an argument recently that turned some heads, to be mm -hmm. sure. Uh, you said uh, that Hamas's October 7th attack was comparable in some ways to Nat Turner's slave revolt, uh, mm -hmm. rebellion of enslaved black Americans in Virginia that took place in 1831. You've also referred to Gaza frequently as a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of historical comparisons probably aren't in the mainstream yet. Uh, in fact, they offend some people, they outrage some people. Why do you make them? Well, the primary reason I make them is because I think they're true. 
Now, uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion was replete with the most horrifying atrocities. Yep. The order Nat Turner, for those of you who don't know, because I don't know what your audience is. Exodus 12.7 advocates for and sets the terms for selling your daughter into slavery. Dude, that's just the free market. Uh, the United States had not a lot, but it had slave rebellions before the Civil War. And the best known one and the most famous one was um, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, they killed about 60 people in the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, the order given by Nat Turner, according to the historians, the order was very straightforward. Kill all whites. Yeah. That was the order. Kill all whites. And they proceed to do just that. So when I read that, when I read that, a light went off on in my head. And I said, OK, now I have something roughly uh, analogous to October 7th. So now my next challenge is, OK, so how do you render a judgment on the Nat Turner Rebellion? So I figured I would go to the people who were, so to speak, closest to me in my political trajectory, yeah. which would be the abolitionists, those who were um, fighting for the end of slavery. However, they were very strictly against the use of violence. And oh, my God, I just realized how fat his calves are, dude. Not the slut shame, but put those away, Norm. God damn, he's got some daddy calves up in this bitch. What the f that's why, I mean, he is in great shape for his age. He's like 800 years old. God damn. That boy thick as hell. He's never coming on. Stop saying he pressed, it's pressed against his leg, okay? My man is literally about to burst from the seams, regardless of whether it's pressing on his legs or not. You're out of your mind. That's a big old calf pressed up against his other leg or not, dude. What do you mean? Yeah, it turns out he's not just working his brain out at the library. He's working his body out as well. To Norm Finkelstein, I say, your body is tea. So I was curious, okay, how did they judge, assess the Nat Turner Rebellion? And Show so them free Calfestein. <laughs> I turned to William Lloyd Garrison, who was one of the most famous of the abolitionists. abolitionists. He edited the newspaper called The Liberator. And it's very worth reading it, what he said. He began by saying, we told you so. Because he was speaking to white people. We told you so. We told you, if you keep treating people this way, if you treat them this way. Where'd that, where'd that Christianity doesn't support any of those things guy go? Did he just learn about a lot of stuff about Christianity all of a sudden? That guy stopped talking as soon as we started mentioning Bible verses in here real quick. It shut him down so fast. Like I, I'm like I said, I'm not a r slash atheist Andy at all. I'm not, but it, it is pretty funny that he was just he had to be like, no, dude, you don't understand. Like the Bible is different. The Quran, the final uncorrupted word of God, states the sacred value of human life, unlike any other book like the Bible or gospel that were corrupted by humans. <laughs> okay, dude. Yes, sure. It's the most uh, comprehensive. It's the third version. It's the best version, brother there's going to be a reaction. And he went on to say that, of course, atrocities, or I think he called it horrors, occur during the Nat Turner Rebellion. But if you read the statement from start to finish, he never condemned Nat Turner. He does not. It's, you know, it was for me a, an epiphanal moment because I spent the last 15 or more years of my life chronicling the horrors in Gaza. The fact that those folks who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th had been born into a concentration camp. Not only were they born into it, but they were living in it and they were destined to die in it. And that was Nat Turner. But is this, a, is this an explanation from a dispassionate scholar who's simply saying, look how inevitable this violence on October mm -hmm. 7th was, or is it an endorsement of the action by saying, look, they had no choice. This is literally the only legitimate well, and morally acceptable option they could make. Look, when you, make, when you pass moral judgments, in my opinion, you have to offer options. What else could they have done? So when Hamas was elected in 2006... Well, you just talked about the international courts, right? So well, and you have a growing optimism. Yeah. Does that stuff only happen because of the armed resistance? Mm -hmm. In other words, would we have mm -hmm. the world's attention? Would there I would, be I would, I'm going to say what the facts tell me. Now, I'm not saying I'm the only person in possession of the facts, yeah. but the facts as they tell me. In 2006, when Hamas was elected, it was elected on a reform platform. 
because the Palestinian Authority is so corrupt, people wanted to change. Yeah. If you start, immediately as they were elected, the international community, first Israel, then the US, then the EU, imposed this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. Now, if you study the record, Hamas was attempting a diplomatic solution to the conflict. It talked about recognizing Israel, two states, having a long-term ceasefire. It made many options. All of it was rebuffed. All of it was rejected. Then, in March 2018, they attempted the Great March of Return, a nonviolent civil resistance. What happened? Well, we know exactly what happened. A UN investigative body produced a report with 250 single-space pages. According to the report, Israel targeted, deliberately targeted children. Israel deliberately targeted medics. Israel deter deliberately targeted um, journalists. And here's the best one of all. Israel deliberately targeted disabled people. Okay? The best one. And they have the descriptions in the report. <laughs> Not the best one. No, nor. A person in the distance on crutches, 300 meters from the perimeter fence, shot in the head. A person in the wheelchair, 200 meters, shot down. So, of course, the nonviolence is going to fail. If people are just being shot down, like, you know, swatted down like flies, and there's no international reaction, it can't work. The whole premise of nonviolent civil resistance is that if you're willing to incur the suffering, then the international community, or in the case of our own country during the civil rights movement, the North and the federal government will be moved by the violence, moved in sympathy uh, to act. When you show the violence, remember the whole point of nonviolence as uh, Martin Luther King understood it. If you read, for example, the letter from the Birmingham jail. The Bible had a detailed guide on how to buy slaves with itemized prize list. What the f I mean, at least they put a standard on it. Exodus 21, 7, 11. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she will not be freed at the end of six years as the men are. If she does not satisfy her owner, he must, be al he must allow her to be brought back again. But he is not allowed to sell her to foreigners since he is the one who broke the contract with her. Why are you going Southern? I mean, come on. Why aren't Islamic countries free? They're the last of all the slavery and to raise wait misrepresenting a text is a lot different than just clearly taking direct action because of what your text says i don't have time to respond to all these guys wait what do you mean bro you think the crusades didn't happen george w bush said god told him to invade iraq do you think the one million death toll is attributed to christianity as a consequence of that or do you think he was just kind of saying that because you have the capacity to identify and separate christianity from the actors but you cannot demonstrate that same thing when it comes to islam being monolithic I've already addressed these talking points a million times over, but I can duke it out with you over and over again if you would like. Why aren't Islamic countries free when they're the last of all the slavery and to raise the age of cassette is a coincidence? Yeah, dude, the, la the, the Islamic country of France, the Islamic country of the Japans raised the age of consent, the Islamic country of Alabama, the Islamic country where child marriages is seen as totally permissible by the very same people that say Islamic countries are so backwards thinking. Come on, dog. Come to me with some something better. And as far as slavery goes, America has the highest prisoner per capita density of all nations on the planet. The United States is only 4% of the entire world's in population, yet has 25% of its enslaved incarcerated population the united states of america also constitutionally allows slavery slavery still is very much an industry in this country it is called our prison system but yet you do not consider that to be an aberration you do not consider that to be an abomination you consider that to be good i suspect <clears throat> tennessee where people say two children you're the only 10 i see and the 10 doesn't refer to their looks, but instead their age. Shut the f up. And as far as the Bible, how many times have been disproven? I'm into history as far as I can tell. You can Google it yourself. There's not been a single archaeological discovery that goes against it. Plus, we wouldn't have any Western nation. Wait, what the f This boy said the Bible is historically accurate? Yo! I didn't realize this guy was writing for Christianity. I thought he was going to have the decency to try to make it seem like he's like, oh, I'm against all religion. He's like, no, actually, the Bible is literally correct. Google it. Who? Who? Prove him wrong? You think Jesus Christ unironically turned water into wine, dude? If you do think that, 
There has not been a single archaeological evidence that proves anything that the Bible has, dude. Yeah. There's archaeological evidence that proves that Jesus Christ walked on water. And also, there's archaeological evidence that, like, yeah, no, Jesus' mommy was actually f***ed by God. This guy's awesome. Prove the Bible is not correct in one picture. Yo, chill! Dude, you're going to trigger this guy. You're going to trigger this guy. Places, prophecies, history. Oh, this guy's awesome, dude. Dude, there's nothing funnier to me than a dude who is, like, unironically the same, like, mullah that he is criticizing, but in America for Christianity. He's like, yeah, these fundamentalists, the entirety of the religion rep is represented by these fundamentalists. Oh, also, I'm a fundamentalist for Christianity, but that's good and right and proven by archaeological digs. Brother, uh, I say to you, okay, brother. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Dude, it's so funny. I thought he was one of those like r slash atheist guys. This guy's awesome. I don't force my opinions on anyone. <laughs> yeah, probably because the last time you tried to do that, people were like, yeah, no, dog. I think you're hallucinating. <laughs> Here's one for him. I challenge anybody to find one piece of information in the Bible that you can prove to be false. Not that you. Easy enough. Genesis 3230 says that Jacob saw God face to face. Exodus 33 says that Moses saw God face to face. But John 118 and 1 Timothy 616 both say that no one has ever seen God. This guy is going, oh, actually, the Bible is contradicted by other passages in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it's true, but who cares? <laughs> so if these verses are true, then these are false and vice versa. It, it is kind of funny to go um, r slash atheist when you, when you see a dude who's like super, super invested in, in defending the Bible. And I'm not Republican. Those verses need context. Moses did not see him face to face. He was in the presence of him. Oh, okay. My man's got so much context. My man has got so much context when it comes to the Bible. Meanwhile, he's like, every, every Muslim wants to do rapes and are pedophiles. Because <laughs> the Quran said so. Oh, that's awesome. The Islamic scriptures in the Quran were actually far less bloody and less violent than those in the Bible and cites explicit instructions in the Old Testament calling for genocide while the Quran calls primarily for defensive war. Philip Jenkins, professor, professor of religious studies. Wait, what do you mean? Does it not? Bro, you are awesome. You actually are awesome. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, baby. Remember when your original point was that like the Bible doesn't have any slavery in it? And then when I told you that it does, you very quickly swapped it to, well, actually, Islamic countries uh, still have slavery. And when then I told you Christian countries still have slavery, like the one that you're uh, defending, you you quickly swapped it to prove me wrong. The Bible is actually real. Everything that it prophesized is correct. Becoming in increasingly more unhinged. You're awesome, and I love you. Thank you for being you. Keep popping off, King. The end times are coming. If the Bible isn't real, how did Putin open the oldest vault and show that all the biblical figures were black? We don't talk about that. This chatter a student debating their religion 101 professor energy? Okay, but this chatter is also unhinged, so like any theology professor would, would cook this dude. Other people who are religious in the chat are cooking this dude. <laughs> Calm like a Tom. Thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Please guest star him, I beg you. I don't want to guest star him. He's a little he's a little too gross for my taste. 20k, yikes. This place is falling off, huh? 36 month subscriber. Yeah, it's it's over, dude. Hassan, are you a Zing guy? Saying opening it up only reinforces Hamas. It says that Hamas methods work. What do you suggest that Israel do the next time Hamas has a mass terror attack? 36 month subscriber. Welcome back into the fold, baby. You and 10,000 other people just like you uh, left the community specifically because you could not cope with the reality that the country that you have learned was actually good and infallible is, as a matter of fact, bad. Welcome back to the community, though. We welcome you with open arms as long as, you know, you change your ways. Yeah, that is true. 10,000 individuals in this community left after October 7. Because they could not cope with the reality that Israel is an apartheid state conducting ethnic cleansing. Some of them are coming back now, slowly but surely, because they're recognizing that maybe Israel is doing some bad shit. We missed you. I hope you stay. We welcome you with open arms. Welcome back. What do you mean? I really don't think it was that much. Bro, my average concurrent before October 7 was 30K. My average concurrent after October 7, like once the, once uh, that shit 
unwound and people uh, were no longer paying attention, uh, it, it went down to 20K. You were getting 40K after October 7? No, that was only because everyone was interested in learning about what the f*** was going on. You're wrong. Ay ay ay. And no, I did not change my opinion. And I will not change my opinion. But anyway, like I said, listen, used to be super confusing to me as a Jewish kid growing up. We were taught in Hebrew school that Republicans were the only ones that care about Israel, only to vote for them, even when everything else we believed in did not align with any conservative. It's a trip. I still want Israel to have its state, but I don't want Bibi Netanyahu. People shouldn't be confused about Bibi being a psycho. His brother died fighting PLO members in the 70s. Bibi shouldn't have power. He is too compromised. Super Used to be super confusing to me as a Jewish kid growing up. Saying opening it up only reinforces Hamas. It says that Hamas meth is work. I still love you, man. Listen, liberal Zionists are coming back in every day. Was that chatter really here for 36 months? You've been talking about Palestine for years now? It shouldn't have been a surprise that this happened. It's different. Oh, he unfollowed. Oh, well, I guess he's not coming back. He just came back in to say, yikes, you fell off, Andy. I did not. 20K is still pretty solid. But not only that, what... Yeah, he brought up Operation Entebbe when his older brother Yoni Netanyahu died as a reason for why he's compromised. Yeah. Operation Entebbe, I thought, I think incorrectly, that because of Israel's policy of not having two brothers uh, go on the same operation, I thought there was a chance that Benjamin Netanyahu could have died in Operation Entebbe as well, but I don't think he was a part of the IDF at that point. I've been watching less after October 7th, not because I'm a Zionist, because I can't handle being the you can only watch trolley meme. Come back, baby, come back, baby, come back. Maybe come back to me. You try to do the podcast and video thing and can't get more than eight likes on a video. He never fell on. Okay, I don't. I'm not even. I'm not even shitting on this guy, bro. Come on, listen, brothers, brothers, understand something. This is a perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. A person that was a supporter for 36 months, dude. Does that not? Does that not like? Does that not change your 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 attitude about this kind of thing? Stop being so rabid. This is a person who loved this community objectively, okay? He's a prick for dropping by and saying that shit. I'm sorry, I can't hold back. This man is alive and stops being a sniveling little shit. I think this is the type of person who can be reasoned with eventually. Can't wait to, for post-Israel ban appeal stream and all the liberal Zionists want to come back. They won't. I think a lot of people won't. I think they're. I think that something legitimately, they, they just like have decided that I'm a terrorist lover the point is, or the thing is, I get it. The date of his last message is when you and Ethan had the debate, Sag. A lot of people left then because drama farmers made a big deal about your and Ethan's disagreements. I know. But that also is alongside, like, I'm sure there are plenty of people who are still in here who didn't like the way that that resolved, okay? That's not the major problem. The major problem is when you already have hangups about Israel or my coverage on Israel, and then that's the final blow for you. <laughs> The point is, and I'm trying to describe this to everybody who doesn't understand. I understand why that person has these positions. There are plenty of people who have been conditioned into believing what many believe in this country. Okay? Many people in this country have been primed into believing that Israel has to exist or else the Holocaust will happen all over and over again. Yeah, no, in 1976, Bibi was graduating MIT. He wasn't even in Israel. Bro, I wish he could have died in Entebbe, but it wasn't meant to be. I know. I, I used to think that uh, Bibi could have died alongside his brother in Operation Entebbe, but he couldn't because he wasn't. I found out later that he wasn't a part of the IDF at that point. Yeah. So I think that I treat this attitude that people have with the exact same, with the exact same care and consideration that I treat those who have like opinions you think i'm dying would have changed israel's course no but it would have been cool not to know about benjamin Netanyahu as a human being i mean he he has like he has definitely shifted israel's reactionary policies in a way more right wing he almost has single-handedly i mean obviously the the population was primed for it but he definitely played a very significant role over the course of the past couple of decades in making um in, in making Israel even more reactionary. Are you still good with Ethan? Yes, I talked to him this morning. Listen to me, okay? Listen to me. I understand where a lot of these people are coming from. This is, we are all, we cannot escape our social programming, our social conditioning, okay? 
So I treat this in the exact same way that I treat anyone with opinions that are reactionary. Do you get it? So instead of like trying to yell at people, and I get why people want to yell at people because some genocide is happening. Okay. But instead of trying to yell at those who we can convert, we should try to be a little bit gentler and, and not sway away from trying to educate people. Okay. That's it. Many of you in this community, and I explain this every day, many of you in this community had some reactionary opinions, some reactionary hangups. I myself did as well, because we cannot escape our social conditioning, but you can escape the top of the hour ad break by subscribing because at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. Now, of course you might think, oh man, what the fuck? I don't want to see this. The hell is that? Well, don't fear not. You can subscribe for five dollars or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. They change where the Twitch Prime button is. I don't know where it is now. Okay, but you can change your mind about seeing the ad break at the top of the hour. I hate you. I am not kidding. It's hard to put up in the emotional labor to do that when it seems like they don't care either way. Generally, not just about H three. We just uh, moved on. No, first of all, emotional labor. If, if, first, if you're not Palestinian, the emotional labor is not even for you, okay? And as far as I know, many Palestinians are taking on that emotional labor and asking you to take on that emotional labor. As someone who is at least like perceived as a Muslim, Islamist, fundamentalist, terrorist lover and supporter, I do take on a shit ton of emotional labor myself personally. So if you're like a white person from Iowa, maybe you shouldn't have as, uh, as, as edgy opinions on educating people, okay? That's my point on the issue of Palestine for sure. Okay. I got to disagree. I think some of those historical developments are actually really tragic. I mean, just one example is that after Rabin was assassinated in 95 and the Perez provisional government was through Bibi won the prime ministerial election by less than 30,000 votes. Yeah. But I remember looking at data that showed that Benjamin Netanyahu was slated to defeat uh, Rabin regardless. That's 1%. I'm no fan of Perez. He sucked. But between 96 and 99, Bibi's positive towards Oslo irreparably damaged the peace process and all for 1% of the votes. Pretty sure Bibi was going to win anyway, or at least he personally thought so. He literally said, I wish Rabin had never been killed because I wanted to defeat him anyway. I was going to defeat him regardless. But yeah, you do have to remember that. You do have to remember this, this key point here, which is that these people who are otherwise very progressive individuals have this weird cognitive dissonance when it comes to Israel. One must ask the question, why? Where does this come from? It's proximity. It's, it's a distance that they have from actual Israel because I feel like a lot of people who do have like liberal Zionist tendencies, as a matter of fact, if they were to really live in it as a constant, well, maybe they could become more reactionary or maybe if they went to the West Bank, for example, they, they would, as many have, change course entirely because they would be absolutely grossed out by how psychopathic the Zionist project is in general, Okay. That's something that you have to remember. But yes, this person is a great example of this. A person who is probably very progressive. <laughs> Libtard. <laughs> it's funny. Yes, but I'm talking about the 96 election, which was very close. He, uh, he thought so because that his narcissism and gall to some extent, but the election was very, very close. Being transphobic and growing up is very different from denying the crystal clear genocide happening right now. I agree with the point you were making, but these specific people need to be ostracized. No. There's a difference. If that person wasn't a 36 month subscriber, I wouldn't be talking about it as much. Ben debate confirmed. Oh boy. Let's do it on my show this Monday at 5 PM at our studios in Nashville. 90 minutes live streamed. Oh, I can't wait to watch this shit. Oh, fuck. Yeah. God, I hate this kind of, because like, I hate when it's Candace Owens defending the position of Palestinians. Ugh, yuck. Uh, but what are you going to do? That's not true. When I was a transphobe, there also was a clear, crystal clear policy of attack on trans people in the States. And yet Hassan has changed my mind. Yeah, I think you're wrong. It is exactly like transphobia. It is so normalized in their worldview. It is so normalized in their worldview that they don't even see it. They think it's like a totally separate thing. They have probably can, uh, they've probably seen the criticisms and have either contextualized it from the framework of like, well, this is a lot of anti-Semitism uh, at, at play here. 
or probably contextualize it by saying, well, Hamas is really, really barbaric and really right wing. Israel's right wing too. Brother, you cannot call our position defending Palestinians. She's defending Palestinians for the same reason as motherfucking Hinkle Dink of all other anti Semites on the planet who are pro Palestine. Yo, no, I agree. That's why I said she is ostensibly on the pro Palestine side in this conversation. That's why I'm saying it's gross that she is the one who is supposedly defending the Palestinian position. It sucks. My point for all is that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from this. Um, my point for for everybody that is uh, in here that has uh, like different opinions on Israel than myself is that I'm always open. I'm always open to receiving people back into this community, no matter what they've said, as long as they genuinely show that they've changed their minds on things. Okay, there's always a chance. Like it's not a thing. Now, many people will hear that and go, dude, receiving me with welcome arms, fuck yourself. 36 months, chatters hating on you now because October 7 is the same as single issue voters. If they followed you for that long and disagree with you on Israel, they, pre they still probably agree with you on 99% of the issues. Yeah, there is literally an entire, there's literally an entire genre of this way of thinking. It's called progressive except Palestine. And it's the same in many Western nations where there are a shit ton of people who are like diehard left-wingers on every issue until Palestine, and then they become diehard right-wingers on that issue, okay? That should cause you to really think about why that is such a commonplace thing. <sighs> it's because it's been seen as, like, the normative position, and I do make fun of that all the time, and I make fun of those guys for their cognitive dissonance, but it doesn't matter when it comes to it, when it comes down to it. Don't, don't you think the main factor is Islamophobia? Yes, Islamophobia is a huge factor. Israeli leftists here have been watching for a couple of years. Thank you for shaping my political upbringing and changing my mind on Israel. There you go. If people who live in Israel can change their opinion on, on this shit, people who live in America can too. He says that violence is embedded in the system. And all we're doing is we're bringing it to the, sis the right. surface. And dramatizing it and putting but, a spectacle on it. Exactly. In order to evoke sympathy. But does it work but, if everyone's... Well, the reason well, that's it what I'm going to say. Oh. <laughs> you, you answered, that's the point. It didn't work in Gaza. It didn't work. So now you're at the, the heart of the dilemma. If diplomacy didn't work, they tried. I'm not saying what they were saying was perfect. I'm not saying it wouldn't have required, you know, intense uh, ne negotiations to make it work. But there were steps taken by Hamas. That didn't work. Nonviolent civil resistance didn't work. And by the time you got to October 6th, it was clear that a deal was going to be made with Sa the Saudis. And then the whole conflict between Israel and the Arab world would have been resolved above the heads of the people of Gaza. And the only thing those two million people would have to look forward to is to languish and die in that concentration camp. So your, before, your, your critics, so, though, would say there was at least an opportunity for hope or possibility. Now there's 33, almost 33,000 people dead, 8,000 of the rubble, schools destroyed, I, I, building, almost I'm entire not, built environment I'm destroyed. Not gonna, I'm not going to defend that. I'm not going to even defend the no, action. No, I know, but what I guess I mean is ultimately, me, was, it a, was, it a, was it a successful plan? Um, you know, I think, I, I think that politics is a very unpredictable business. So let me give you the analogy, and then you can answer me. Yeah. When Nat Turner carries out his rebellion, the immediate reaction was the whites in the South went on a lunatic rampage. They randomly killed about 120 of black people just you know, off the street, as you can imagine what happened. Yeah. And then another 80 were killed, uh, died after being convicted in court. So about 200 black people were killed. That was the first consequence. So many a person like yourself would say, was it worth it? 61 white people were killed and now 200 of us were killed. Was it worth it? What was the second thing that happened? The law changed. After Nat Turner, they passed the law. Black people can't learn how to read. Because Nat Turner was very literate. I said he knew the Bible and yeah. he was very smart. So they banned 34 MKD 50 is back and lacing it up, dude. God damn. 100 total gifted subs. That's crazy. Prohibited teaching a black person to read. Third thing that happened, they prohibited black people from congregating together. Okay. Because the people thought he was giving sermons to the black people. And instead, it turned out they were plotting the uh, uh, rebellion. Okay. So someone like you would say, did that make any sense? Was it worth it? Right. 200 black people were killed, or 30,000 Gazans were killed. Uh, the law is now more repressive than ever, okay? 
So there's an argument there. But then along comes John Brown. And when you read John Brown, he says, I was inspired by Nat Turner. Okay. So then you could say, well, John Brown, what did he accomplish? His uh, uprising was put down in, the few, uh, in a, about a couple of days. Right, he was executed. John Brown, perfect demonstration of a quirked up white boy. Another very religious guy, by the way. I would say a religious nutter, as a matter of fact. Straight up, it, like as close to insane as you can get. But sometimes you need that, okay? The most swagged out white boy to have ever done it. He was so crazy that literal black liberation advocates were like, yeah, dog, I think you're just going to die. Like, and I don't want to die yet. And he was like, nope, I'm going to do the damn thing. And he did go to with the sauce. Okay. But then along comes Frederick Douglass and he delivers his famous speech on John Brown, one of his best, in my opinion. And he says, he goes through all the arguments. John Brown was a failure for this reason. John Brown was a failure for that reason. John Brown was a failure for this reason. And John Brown, like, you know, Nat Turner was a religious fanatic. So was John Brown. John Brown was just like Nat Turner. He was convinced he was a vessel of God and slavery was an abomination, which it was. But most people yeah. didn't believe it. It was Frederick Douglass, right? That was like, nah, nah, dude. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> John, you're weed too bad here. You're way too strong, John Brown. You're bitch too bad. They'll kill you. Dude, you are going to die, is what he said. Which he did. Except some point to his um, execution as the, the like, arbiter of the, the, the Civil War. If it was that degree of abomination right. that you're going to give your life for it, okay? John met him in the 1840s with his plan, and Douglas said, that's an insane idea. You'll die. So, along comes... Uh, Frederick Douglass, and he says, you know, there's a straight arrow line from John Brown to the Civil War. Now, okay, Norm. God, I love Norm so much. He's so crazy, but like... Turner, John Brown, Civil War. Now, I know I leave out a lot of other factors, yeah. but it was a way station to the Civil War. And now Nat Turner occupies an honored place in American history. Yeah. The thing is, dude, listen, listen, listen. The thing is, sometimes people just need to be shown that it is permissible, okay? Sometimes people need to be shown that it is allowed or that people are willing to take the initiative. That's what is important. I think that's what Norm is showing too here. Like these, these actions that might on its face come across as like tactical errors, who knows what kind of positive outcomes they may yield. So I say, I know people won't like it when I say it, but I think it's a question mark how October 7th is going to be regarded so, in so the future. If Nat Turner now occupies an honored place, I think it's a question mark. Um, and, and I think part of that will depend on Israel's response and continued mm -hmm. response. I mean, what do you think, given all the destruction, all the death mm -hmm. of people and the physical environment, what do you think Netanyahu's ultimate end game is here? The goal is... Uh, at one end of a spectrum, and the spectrum bleeds into each point, bleeds into each other. At one end is the ethnic cleansing, to just get rid of them, do what they did in 1948, and put an end to this uh, Gaza problem. But is that a realistic vision? I mean, I understand the idea of saying we're going to have civil and governmental mm -hmm. control over Gaza, we're going to maybe reinstall settlements as the pre-2006 mm -hmm. time. I doubt that. Right, but, but it seems equally doubtful that they could depopulate well, the entire I, I, okay. strip. Let's remember, uh, time moves quickly. The first two weeks, it looked like, or they believed, that they were going to be able to expel the population to the Sinai. But at that point, Egypt made a firm decision, they're not coming in. Yeah. So one goal was the ethnic cleansing, but I agree with you, after two weeks, it seemed less plausible. No one still might happen. We don't know, you know, the pressures that will be exerted on CC. Uh, number two, the sort of middle position was the one that was advocated by Giora Island. Uh, the former head of the National Security Council, he said, we'll give them two choices, stay and starve or leave. Mm. In other words, make Gaza uninhabitable. And then the other the extreme position was to just carry out, you know, a destruction of Amalek to just wipe out the population in a kind of unnuanced uh, genocide. Yeah. So I think those are the three positions and what, what will come of it. What do you think is most likely to come of it? Um, what's most likely? I think uh, 
because President Biden is having trouble with that or a large part of that Democratic base, I think the Gallup polls show that only 19 percent of Democrats supported what Israel is doing. Yeah. Uh, I think the pressures exerted by uh, Biden will become unbearable for Israel. Uh, and in the United States, is it, what is it? What is it unbearable? It will be another profiling purge, like we saw at the Security Council, where they just abstained. No, look. If the United States wanted to stop it from day one, it could have stopped it. You just pick up the phone and say, "No more veto, no more weapons. Uh, it's over, and it's over." There's, there's no question about is that. Is that possible as, as as a practical matter, given mm -hmm. this special relationship that right. the U.S. has had since the '60s? Well, it's it's uh, it's possible. The question is uh, the political will, and right now, President Biden is balancing. The uh, what they considered was Nat Turner based. I don't know. Do you think slavery was based to be their security interest? Because, you know, what happened October 7th was a blow for the United States security also because the United States has invested a lot in Israel as a regional power and, and able to be a regional arbiter. Let, let me pause you on that for a second, because I spoke the other day to uh, Professor Mearsheimer, mm -hmm. uh, who said that it's a myth that uh, there's still a strategic and tactical interest for the United States to support Israel. Mm -hmm. That may have once been the case, but. It's not anymore. All right, look, uh, John look at this guy. I don't know. Do you think the Al Qassam brigades are based then? <clears throat> I don't know. Do you think Israel's genocide is based? Because the same energy you have can be carried over in this exact same conversation. Like, I don't know why you think this is a gotcha. It's the same principle behind the uh, the the uh, Haitian Revolution. Okay, I can't believe you would try to sit here and 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 advocate. The point is, the point is, when all is said and done. Ain't nobody's talking about the ANC and their practices of terrorism. And everyone celebrates their final political goal of the eradication of the South African apartheid as an objective good. Because the much greater evil here is the apartheid. The much greater evil here is the Israeli genocide of Palestinians. Things that people do in opposition to that, well, if their project succeeds and it is completely destroyed... Things that, people have, things that people have done in opposition to that are always praised later down the line. Tom Mearsheimer is a good friend of mine. I like him. Uh, <laughs> but? We don't agree. I mean, people, are, you know, people are, are, can agree to disagree. I, I don't agree on that point. I think the important thing to understand about Israel is Israel is very much like a Western society. It has the same kind of uh, bureaucracy, rationality, uh, modern outlook uh, that makes it very easy for the U.S. to communicate with Israel. And communication is not an, a trivial part. The security people, the intelligence people, they all have the same mental outlook. And so that's an irreplaceable factor for the U.S. to have a uh, what's sometimes called a stationary aircraft carrier in, in the Middle East. Where an unsinkable whole, one. Uh, mental outlook is held in common. Also, it's still by far the most militarily competent. I'm, I'm not saying it's great. Um, it took a hit reputationally yeah, as well. It took a very big hit reputationally. And I don't think that was an accident. The, the rot has set in in Israeli society. It's become westernized. And that means there's an element of slovenliness to the way they, carry, they conduct themselves. You said you watched. Oh, um, this is actually an interesting point. The debate I had. Yes, you This is actually an interesting point that he just brought up. The rod has been said in Israeli society, they become westernized, is actually also correct. When Israel was doing the Nakba before Israel, it was people that had a shit ton of experience fighting in wars that had nothing to lose. Okay? You had World War II veterans. You know what I mean? Obviously, they were still going up against, like, people who did not have a lot of experience fighting, mostly villagers. And from that point on, all the way until even 1967, um, a lot of the, the Israeli brigades were, uh, were, were still very much coming from war-torn regions, people that have even been pogromed, people that, uh, people that had a lot of experience... I think it was with Felix that I was talking about this, like um, the idea, for example, that um, the idea, for example, that like the Israeli spy apparatus was better early on because many of the Israelis were 
not uh i guess like westernized but they were still like very much first generation from arab countries so they could actually like you know they could actually blend in very well um the very fact that when you hear for example when they try to do like fake telephone conversations like you can just hear the dude is not uh, uh like a palestinian oh i think i was talking to noah Cullen about it you're right maybe not felix um, where like you can just kind of tell that that position of privilege and that position of complacency and comfort has basically made the the Israeli military uh, much worse overall too. That arrogance and that hubris also led to October seven. Your epic, almost five-hour debate with uh, Moyen Rabani and uh, Benny Morris and and something else, <laughs> yeah. Destiny, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, and it was striking, at the very end of the debate, I said that Israel now faces a strategic uh, dilemma, a serious strategic dilemma. The dilemma is that a large number of people in the Arab world after October 7th suddenly came to the realization or the epiphany, hmm, Israel is not as strong as we thought it was, or Israel is not as invincible as we thought it was. Yeah. And yep. Benny Morris at that point, Professor Morris, very smart guy, he kind of had a nervous laugh and he said, ah, oh, that's ridiculous. We have atomic bomb. We have nuclear weapons. Right. What was striking to me about that answer was he didn't say we have the IDF, we have the army. He had lost faith in it. Hmm. So now he had to talk about Damn. the deterrence of their nuclear weapons. So I don't believe that October 7th was a passing error mistake a moment of incompetence. It was a reflection of the fact that Israel no longer is what it once was. Now, of course- Are they gonna flex their muscles though to prove that they actually do have capacity? Well, that's what they're doing now. Goading perhaps Hezbollah. Uh, Obviously, we also have the Houthis in, in, in the Red Sea who, mm -hmm. with their uh, sea blockade, and we also have the Hamas issue. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a thought here that to show that they're yeah, still right. invincible. I, I think there's a very big problem there. Yeah. I think the problem is that Israel has one of its central military concepts, this is what it calls its deterrence capability. And deterrence capability is just a fancy term for the Arab world's fear of us. And they are very worried now that the Arab world... Arab leaders aren't angels, though. They share the same accountability with the USA and EU. Bro, I'm not talking about the rest of the Arab world, okay? Because of what happened on October 7th, no longer fears them. And so one of the reasons for what's been happening is, in their language, to restore their deterrence capacity. And that does seem to include if they had any balls, Hezbollah. So they do a I fraction of what the Yemen far, uh, population has done from with the far end less of what began on October 7th. And it could take forms which will or at least be apply a real political pressure. maybe a global catastrophe. Professor Frankelstein, thanks so much for joining me on the front. It's You're a welcome. talking to you. That was such a fever dream when I watched it this morning. You've said the exact same thing Norman Mark discussed for the past six months and years when you covered this occupation, bar per puck and bar. We're on the right side of history. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why I love Norm. Dude, the secret 8200 commander being exposed story is so funny. The whole story is that his secret identity was exposed as he was tracked through his book. But dude, it's so bad. You can literally Google his name, file type, XLSX, and you find government documents saying 8200 commander Yossi Sariel, a true titan of intel. Yeah. I love those blunders, dude. Are you talking about the Gulf states only, right? Not the whole Arab world? Yeah, I'm talking about... I'm not even talking about the people that live in the Gulf states, chatters. I'm talking about the leadership.